And so, without further delay, Sioux Atlanta is proud to be able to present three speakers from its own staff for this evening's conservation lecture. Dr. Joseph Mendelson, Laura Mayo, and Lisa Smith. Each will highlight projects in which they are involved. I feel certain that we'll probably be in for a few laughs, perhaps a few tears, as our speakers guide us behind the scenes at Zoo Atlanta and around the world. Our first speaker this evening is Lisa Smith. With 13 years experience working with terrestrial and marine wildlife, Lisa is Zoo Atlanta's curator of large mammals, which includes elephants, giraffe, rhinos, zebra, warthogs, water buck, gazelle, bongo, and dikers, as well as the outback station kangaroos and wallabies and the petting zoo animals. Lisa holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Akron and is currently pursuing a master's degree from George Mason University. She's also the AZA institutional representative for several advisory groups and SSPs. And just recently, Lisa was elected to the Rhino SSP Steering Committee. If you've ever wondered about the inner workings of enrichment and training at Zoo Atlanta, then you're sure to enjoy Lisa's talk, which will highlight the way Zoo Atlanta to animal staff enhance the quality of captive animal care. Caring for captive endangered species requires more than providing a clean environment or nutritious food. More often it involves ways, finding ways to ensure that the animals thrive, not just merely survive. So let's step behind the scenes and take a lighthearted look at the ways the Behavioral Husbandry Program addresses psychological needs of Zoo Atlanta's animals through environmental enrichment and positive training. So please welcome Lisa Smith. Good morning, or good evening. Oh my gosh. Normally I give this lecture at Zoo Biology. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Can everybody hear me if I step away? Well, thank you, Debbie, for that great introduction. We have a wonderful staff and a wonderful program here at Zoo Atlanta, and it's my privilege to share with you guys what we're doing behind the scenes that a lot of times you don't get a chance to see. Isn't that the cutest picture ever? <laughs> <laughs> Our mission at Zoo Atlanta states that we are to inspire our guests to value wildlife. And when you look at animals like that, how can you not be inspired? That's one of the things that makes us very unique as a zoo, is we have live animals for which that we can share. And it's through the training and enrichment programs that we can really ex get those animals to express their natural behaviors and get them excited about everything. But conservation really begins at home with our collection. So what do, what do we have? We have 20, 228 uh, species, 832 specimens. Um, you can see the breakdown between mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians. Our enrichment and training programs reach into every single animal group that we have here. Even the Komodo dragon will enter into a crate sh and shift on command. But who's responsible? We have over 75 people responsible for the care of our collection, including keepers, curators, our vice president of collections and education and conservation, our director of animal programs. We have a commissary team or an animal nutrition team that keeps our animals fed. So there's quite a few people that really affect the quality of care that we give to our animals. So it really comes down to what is that care for animals. What are we doing? We have a nutrition, um, nutrition and health department through our veterinary staff that take care of those needs along with the keeper staff. We have an animal husbandry focus where we're looking at what are the basics? What, you know, food, water, shelter, temperature regulations, what are those animals being kept at? We're looking at habitat designs of their enclosures to try to mimic as best we can in a captive environment where an animal would come from. We have our behavioral husbandry, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. And we have our research team that's using science to kind of better all of those things. Behavioral husbandry is focusing on animal psychological well-being as well as their physical well-being. Specifically, we're looking at the psychological needs through that habitat design, environmental enrichment, and positive animal training techniques. Another cutie pie picture. So why are, why are meeting those needs so important? Well, basically, all of us could stay in this room and survive as long as somebody came and provided us food and water. We have excellent ambient temperature. We have shelter over our heads, so we're not going to get sunburned. We're not going to freeze at night. 
But truthfully, I think we'd all get sick of looking at one another. So we want our animals to thrive. We want to give them enclosures that they can hide in. We want to give them things that they can manipulate and do to mentally stimulate them. We want them to really enjoy their life and become happier animals and healthier animals as a result. So thriving animals will often reproduce. They will often um, exhibit normal activity patterns. So looking at their wild counterparts helps us determine normal activity budgets for those animals. Um, we want them to be confident. They're going to move around their enclosures like they own the place. They, we want them to own the place. It's theirs. Um, but they're also going to rest in a relaxed manner. And this is not something that we think about so often, as our visitors often complain, why is that animal sleeping? They need to sleep. They need to get their rest just like we do. So animals that thrive sleep too. Enrichment, environmental enrichment, behavioral enrichment, it's got a lot of terms that go with it. But basically enrichment is a term used to describe the various activities that zookeepers do um, to keep their and encourage their animals doing naturalistic behaviors, keep them um, mentally stimulated, giving, giving them an opportunity to exercise maybe some perceived control and choice in their environment. There's our cutie pie. Bernas. Um, <clears throat> increasing sensory um, stimulation, increasing motor skills, um, cognitive demands, stimulating learning, physical activity, exploration, all of those things help decrease kind of abnormal behaviors or stereotypic behaviors that you sometimes see in captive animals. These are the swaying that you may see in elephants or the pacing that you may see in cats and bears. So giving them opportunities to do other things helps decrease those kind of undesirable behaviors. We want to increase normal healthy activity levels. We want to be able to increase a behavioral repertoire so animals like Great apes that can learn tool use, learn tool use through enrichment. We want to be able to enable animals to co cope with kind of perceived challenges in their lives. So the occasional time where a veterinarian may need to do a health check on them or a zookeeper may need to get closer than an animal is comfortable with, by giving them opportunities to work through those kind of scary times, they're able to kind of cope with them in more acceptable ways. And we want to provide them semi-unpredictable and complex environments. If we all stayed like this in our chairs, we'd be very bored in about an hour. So giving them the opportunities. Other benefits to enrichment are um, overall quality of life is enhanced. There are successful reintroduction projects. The Golden Lion Tamarin one that we are a part of here at Zoo Atlanta has been a phenomenal success. One pair of Golden Lion Tamarins from Zoo Atlanta has over 100, I think closer to 160 descendants in the wild range of Brazil because Zoo Atlanta did the re participated in the reintroduction project. But most important, having healthy, active animals increases public interest when they come to our zoo. And by increasing that, that interest, they have a greater appreciation for the animals. They're more open to learning about animals, more open to learning about our natural world. And that increased knowledge makes them more educated as far as living greener, taking other actions. And sometimes that action is just buying a membership and coming back to the zoo. And sometimes that action may have a greater impact. You never know what, who you're going to talk to in a given day when we're talking about our animals. You never know how you're going to Watching an animal do something really cool is going to affect a kid and what they're going to do with that knowledge as they grow up. So that's the most important thing besides the quality of life for the animal for doing enrichment. So let's talk about what kinds of enrichment there is. There's environmental, which is looking at substrates that might be in an enclosure, looking at climbing structures, looking at places to hide, looking at furniture that you may want to put in, we call logs and climbing branches, those are furniture to us. Um, <laughs> we want to also create visual barriers, letting animals 
hide from the public periodically or hide from each other. Here again, all of us in this room staring at each other might get a little old, so I, I might need some alone time, so I'm going to go sit behind this chair over here. So having, having that opportunity to get away from one another is also important with social animals. But we do want to have social animals when appropriate. So giving animals access to cage mates, doing introductions, <clears throat> giving animals time to play with one another, giving them opportunities for that, that socialness when it's called for, those are also part of our enrichment program, although also part of our husbandry program. Being able to manipulate objects, having puzzle feeders, all of that stuff, that's also very important. And this is an ongoing, kind of let you in on one of those behind the scenes things, this is an ongoing debate within the animal care department, is we spend a lot of money on naturalistic habitats and planting trees and putting bushes and putting mulch in. And then I go and put a traffic cone in and it. Well, the one thing that I want you guys to take away from this lecture tonight, as far as my part goes, is every object has a purpose, everything. And I love the lion picture in the middle. That's kind of my, my example in this picture. Because I can put a tree out there, I can put a rock out there, but Kamau is not going to stalk either of those things. And stalking is a natural behavior that we want a lion to do. We want the lions to crawl. We want them to, to get excited, get that heart racing. We want them to think about going around it so that fake giraffe's not going to see them. <laughs> we want them to smell it so they've sprayed some kind of deer must or something on it. We want to really get him excited. And he tore that thing to shreds, <laughs> tore it to shreds. This is every object has a purpose whether it looks like it or not, and sometimes our visitors see the aftermath of the torn pieces of paper and they don't understand what has happened. But every object, every puzzle feeder has a purpose and it's getting some kind of reaction from that animal. It even gets the elephants moving pretty quick. Now that picture has nothing to do with sensory, but I had to put it in. So what are we doing? We want to we wanna get the five senses stimulated to the best of our ability. Now we recognize that some of our animals may have you know, echolocation or they can hear sounds below our hearing. We, we recognize that some, some of that stuff's really hard to imitate. So we try to do the best we can on the five ones we know we can hit. So the visual is really important to quite a few of our animals. Um, we, kind of consider visual in some of our exhibit designs. The Lion Rock does, at one point, overlook the, um, the hoof stock yard so he can see some of the critters over there. Um, it gives him a vantage point. He can see almost 360 around his enclosure. The mirrors are really important for some animals. If we have to pull a flamingo and have it be by itself, um, mirrors are extremely important because flamingos don't recognize that it's themselves in the mirror. They think if we put two mirrors up, he's got two buddies. <laughs> Not that bright. But it's true. It's totally true. The same thing would probably happen if I did a mirror for a giraffe. So it's not just the birds. So mirrors are important. We do a lot of stuff for the great apes, TVs, computers. Um, they have their own lava lamps. Children of the 60s know what those are. Um, that they watch the oil go up and down on. Um, there's just all kinds of things. We can paint things in their behind the scenes enclosures. We can use different colored balls. We can use all kinds of things to kind of visually stimulate another animal. <clears throat> we also use sound in our enclosures. The keepers will play nature CDs um, behind the scenes, which are kind of interesting. There are over 70 different nature CDs in the zoo's collection right now. Um, and they range from the call of the loons to the call of the whales to the sounds of the rainforest. Um, they're pretty amazing. Um, and everybody always asks me, do you ever get any reactions? And the truth is we do sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes we do. The first time we played the loon sound for the giraffe, 
they literally went, what is that? I mean, they bent down, they tried to get as close to the radio as they could to hear what that sound was. The first time we played the whale sound to the rhinos, Boma started calling back. Now, those of you that know Boma's story are not surprised. But he did. He started doing his high-pitched squeal. He was like, whoa! It was very scary. We turned it off. We were afraid. We don't know what the whales were saying, but it was not good. It was scaring him. He can listen to it now, thank goodness. But it took him a while. So we do play sounds for the animals. Like I said, sometimes, you know, the sound of the rain, you know, the sound of the ocean, they're like, whatever, turn it off. We're trying to sleep here. But sometimes we do get reactions, and so that we try to note when we get those reactions so that we can play those ones maybe a little bit infrequently so that when they hear it again, they're, they get that, a different reaction the next time they hear it. And then, of course, they do listen to each other, and we do try to desensitize them to sounds um, of like construction equipment or cars driving by, things that they may hear that would otherwise scare them. Taste, I love Waffle Houses, you know, little menu things, scattered, splattered, covered, smothered. That's what we do with our food. We cut it up, we put a hole, sometimes we freeze it, sometimes we hide it in things, sometimes we put it in puzzle feeders. We try to, as best we can, promote natural feeding strategies. So if they're a foraging species, we try to hide food so they forage for it. Um, granted, ice pops are not found in the wild too often. <laughs> but think about what it does. A giraffe that's licking on an ice pop is using its tongue. That's very important to a giraffe. In the wild, they would be picking leaves off of trees. They don't get that opportunity a lot in, in the captivity. You know, they do get browsed, but they don't get to do it 24 hours. So they get to lick on that. When pieces come off, they get to play with it in their mouths, another tongue play. For, um, for like the elephants, if they have an ice pop, they're moving it around with their trunk. That's getting trunk dexterity. It's building muscles in that trunk. So here again, it's a, there's a purpose to it. The keepers have put a lot of thought behind it. And all of the curators and all of the veterinarians on staff have approved every single enrichment item that we, ha that we give to our animals. Smell. I don't know how I was going to show you guys smell. So this is the best I could do. But we do have over 30 approved scents on our um, approved list. We use fresh cut herbs. We use dried herbs. We present them in all different ways. Sometimes it's putting a scent on a cotton ball and hiding it just outside the enclosure where an animal can't quite get to that cotton ball, but they smell something good. Um, sometimes we do have special balls that we can present, like put the cotton balls or put the scent inside of a ball with holes in it, and then the animals can roll it around and smell it. Sometimes we do trails through the exhibits where they'll follow a trail of a smell. So there's all different ways that we can present those things, and it, it's really amazing. Um, who do you guys think likes Listerine? Pandas. Loon Loon, you give her some Listerine, she's going to rub it all over herself. She's it's so excited. Who do you think likes garlic? Rhinos. The smell of garlic drives them crazy. Just love it. So there's all, all different kinds of things. Guess who likes obsession for men? The cats. The cats. Obsession for men, one of the favorites. So we get very creative with our scents. We get cre very creative with how we present them. Um, but we have a good time with it nonetheless. Touch, touch is considered um, kind of the least of the senses because a lot of times most of our animals don't like to be touched. Um, so we do try to give them other things such as uh, natural bristle brushes or maybe some fake grass or something to roll on or we'll give them different kinds of rocks or substrates so they get the sensation of touch in their environment so it's very much tied to the environmental aspect of it. Um, but there are quite a few animals that do like to be touched as far as like scratches or, or that kind of stuff. Um, we don't encourage that with a lot of our animals, but we do have some that do enjoy it. Mostly we try to do it with um, environmental stimulation, but as you can see, the Aldabras really do enjoy a good bath. 
We do do a lot of um, animal training behind the scenes. We try to train um, the majority of our, our mammals and, and birds get some sort of training. Um, some of the more intelligent reptiles get some training. I don't know, are you guys doing any training with the amphibians? Shift training? No? No. <laughs> but we, we try, we try. Um, the reason for that training is that training opens up a whole new world to the animals and to us. Um, we're, through training, we're able to build some pretty deep bonds of trust with our animals, which allows us to provide them with uh, a lot more mental stimulation activities, such as the apes getting computer use or being able to have some of our animals paint. Um, we also, by using training, and we're going to talk about it in a few seconds, a little bit more in depth, we're able to create less stressful situations when it comes to day-to-day -day management through training. Um, and of course, training allows us to have some pretty unique guest opportunities, whether it's uh, a VIP experience with feeding giraffe or seeing a macaw up close or even going down to the petting zoo and getting that, that bond with those goats and sheep down there. <clears throat> Positive animal training really allows animals to participate in their own management. A lot of the training that we do is voluntary. If they don't want to do it, they walk away, and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's okay, because that's what it's meant to do. So we try to get as many animals as possible to do what we call stationing, which basically means come over to me and stand still so I can look at you. And we stare at each other, eye to eye. And by getting them close enough to do that, we can see if they have cuts, we can see if they have bruises, we can inspect them, we can see if there's any abnormalities or anything we should be worried about. We get a lot of our animals to target, which means basically put your body part to this funny looking stick thing with a ball on it. And we, by having animals target, we can manipulate body parts, we can have them come close, we can have them go far away, we can move them from room to room or, or from uh, a back area to an exhibit by following this target. We get a lot of our animals to shift either from a barn to an exhibit or for, into a kennel. This was Rosie learning how to go into her crate when we shipped her to Miami a few years ago. This is really important work. Getting an animal to walk into a box is really hard to do. They don't want to do it. It's not something that comes naturally. They're like, oh, let's walk into the box and go to Miami. Let's just do it. Yeah, it doesn't happen. As much as I showed her the bikini and said you could wear it, it just didn't work. So we have to desensitize them. We have to train them. We have to work them through it. And, and that training takes lots of small steps. And we, we break it down into little tiny baby steps. And they get a piece of food or they get a scratch behind the ears, or they get a toy every time they do something right. They, every time they make a step forward that we want them to make. That's the kind of training that we're doing. It's all positive. It's all little tiny baby steps. We can get them to do some general body exams. Jody's been working great magic with all of the gorillas up there as, as well as the other gorilla staff and getting, being able to use a stethoscope to listen to Taz's heart or getting him to turn his back to them. Getting a, a gorilla to turn his back to you is one of the biggest signs of trust that you can have as an animal keeper. Gorillas don't like to turn their backs on you. They just don't. So being able to do this just is a huge accomplishment for Jody. She's actually practicing for an injection. He didn't, I don't think he's going to like that too much. But being able to open their mouth, look in their mouth, looking at gums, looking at teeth, looking at fingernails, all very important parts of the training. Being able to look at an animal's gums is, tells us a lot. If the gums are pale, if the gums are swollen, if they're bright red. That, it's one of the first things Maria will ask us when we tell her that an animal's not feeling well. Well, did you look in their mouth? What's their mouth look like? because your mouth tells you a lot about an animal. Uh, being able to do footwork. The elephants get regular pedicures. If we didn't have them wanting to cooperate with us and do it voluntarily, it'd be, it'd be quite a challenge. So the girls will put their feet up. We can give them their pedicures. 
Lori won't let me paint them pink. <laughs> but what can you do? We do a lot of shoot and scale training um, where we get an animal to step up on a scale. This is really important because we can monitor their weight. If they gain a lot of weight, maybe we're feeding them too much, maybe they're pregnant. Um, if they lose a lot of weight suddenly, maybe they have an illness that needs to be addressed. So being able to get an animal's weight, whether it's a rhino, a bongo, a bird, is an important part of this training program. Now using positive reinforcement training, we can do a lot of extra stuff. Stuff that in years past would have required an, an anesthetic procedure where we had to have the veterinarians come and actually um, put the animals under like a sleeping gas and take them down to the clinic and it would be very stressful on them and very stressful on us. By getting an animal to voluntarily put out its ear to take a sample of blood, we can monitor vitamin E levels. We can monitor white blood cell count. We can monitor pregnancy. We're actually monitoring Dottie, the elephant's pregnancy. Uh, by the way, Dottie is a year pregnant as of yesterday. And we're going to talk about her in just a second. But we're able to monitor her, her pregnancy through taking blood once a week from an ear vein. Now we're actually using, this is the most amazing part to me, we're using 22 gauge needles. These are the tiniest, tiniest needles on the biggest animals. And it's so funny because, especially with the rhinos and the elephants, they have parts of their skin that are as thin as the skin on our wrist. So you just pop that needle in there. They think of it as a bug bite. Give me a piece of watermelon and I'm happy. <laughs> we can also do ultrasounds and reproductive assessments. We monitored Dottie for several months before we tried our uh, artificial insemination on her, making sure that her reproductive tract was healthy, making sure there weren't any cysts in there, making sure there weren't any problems. We've been ongoing monitoring uh, Rosie for the same thing. Rosie's flatlining, which means she's no longer having a regular cycle. So why is that? Is, there, is it mental because her and Boma don't get along, or is it physical? So far, it's been mental. So what do we do? We look at our animal management. Maybe we need to switch out animals again. Maybe we need to mix things up. So being able to do these kind of things helps us long-term in day-to-day -day care, but it also helps us with long-term management. Um, and yes, with rhinos and elephants, that is a rectal ultrasound. We did do an artificial insemination last year at this time uh, on Dottie, our 24-year-old female African elephant. This was the probe that was used. Ouch. <laughs> As you can see, Dottie's standing very calmly in, in the ERD. That's an elephant restraint device. She stood in there. She was quite the trooper. We actually had to inseminate her three times over the course of three days, and she, she did it without any argument. She walked right in. Where do you want me? I'll stand right here. Do what you need to do. Just Can I have an extra piece of watermelon? Can I have that extra piece of lettuce? Um, so there's Adam giving her, um, giving her acc accolades and encouragement while we had our doctors in the back doing their work. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy, but that's what we saw at five months. That's what we saw. That is a baby African elephant inside of the mother. It's a 4D ultrasound that um, our German colleagues that helped us with the insemination did. Uh, they brought their equipment and helped us get that lovely picture. We are trying to duplicate it. We don't have any duplicates yet, but we're, we're working on it. Other things that we can do are radiographs. Um, we're the only zoo in the country that regularly gets voluntary radiographs on their dikers. Sometimes we have to train our animals for special procedures. This is a halter on a giraffe. Um, giraffes don't normally wear halters, in case you were wondering. Um, but we needed, to do, we needed to do a procedure on this giraffe where we did put her under anesthetic. And when a giraffe is under anesthetic, they can't drop their head down below 45 degree angle, otherwise they will aspirate on stomach juices. So by putting this halter on her, we were able to attach it to a cable in the ceiling and that held her head high as she started to fall asleep. And then as she, once she fell asleep, keepers were able to go in and hold her head up throughout the procedure. But without this, her head probably would have dropped down and it would have been an increased risk. And I am very proud to say that she survived that procedure 
and live for another four years afterwards. We do a lot of physical exercise, whether it's walking your hornbill down the main spine of the zoo, giving Jan a ball to play with, or getting da Dottie to do her calisthenics to keep her in shape. <laughs> and that is what she's doing, folks, two hours a day. Um, we do painting with our animals. Um, the crows, the gorillas, lots of animals do painting on the side. So it's a, it's a good stimulation for them and the keepers. We participate in lots of research projects, uh, particularly cognitive studies. And last but not least, we can do all of this and then still have fun. So we do educate through entertainment with our animals. Any questions? and then we'll have everybody answer questions if that's okay with you guys. So thank you, Lisa. Who knew all that stuff was going on when you guys were walking through the zoo? Our second talk this evening will be given by Laura Mayo. She's the assistant curator of primates. Laura has worked with primates for 24 years, spending almost 19 of those years here at Zoo Atlanta. After earning her degree in animal science from the University of Georgia, she began working with primates at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center and the Language Research Center at Georgia State University. Over the span of her career, Laura has provided care for the four ape species, that's orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, as well as numerous species of monkeys. Additionally, Laura helped found and is president of Ape Conservation Effort, an all-volunteer-run fundraising organization whose mission is to raise awareness about and provide financial support for ape conservation. So this evening, Laura will tell us about what Zoo Atlantis orangutans have been doing to help their wild counterparts, whose populations are under severe threat because of habitat loss and illegal pet trade. Laura will also give us an update on how conservation groups in Sumatra, Borneo, and Malaysia are working to ensure a future for wild orangutans in the face of environmental devastation. So please welcome Laura Mayo. Hi, everybody. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'll try to keep up with my usual uh, talking here. Um, let's see, I guess you can put the first slide up there. Um, so tonight I wanted to try to share with you, um, I guess, just some of the things that we've been doing um, behind the scenes with the primate staff, um, mainly since the last year, because I'm trying to find new pictures and stuff for you guys since I just kind of talked last year. but. Um, I suppose the uh, main thing that, um, well, I probably should ask, which ones of these do I press forward? Oh, goody. Um, so the, the biggest thing that we got to deal with um, on the orangutan side of things in the primate department was um, getting Dumati. And um, he is our little orang newest orangutan um, in Shantex group that actually had a, kind of a sad beginning. He was born at the uh, Fort Wayne Children's Zoo in Indiana, and his dad, Tanku, actually is, was originally from Zoo Atlanta. Um, his mother died within an hour after giving birth, probably due to throwing a clot. And um, so they, you know, had to hand rear him. And they had another female there, Malati, who they thought, well, you know what, she's, she's a female orangutan, let's give her a whirl to be a surrogate. Most um, good zoos nowadays, um, it used to be the, the norm was to pull eight babies and hand rear them until they were 10, and then you'd have some crazy ape that running around and um, was never socialized correctly. Now, the, now luckily, the, the more of the norm is to hand rear it, get it healthy and strong, and introduce it to a surrogate of its species. That's the most important thing for these apes or any of the primates is to be with their own kind. So um, they were um, hand rearing Dumati, thinking that um, it was going to, uh, that's what they were going to do with um, Malati. Um, unfortunately, Malati had always had some respiratory issues um, ever since she was a kid, and they just kind of got worse um, right at that, that time that they were hand rearing Dumati, and they just kind of realized that it just wasn't going to be fair to Malati to put that, this awful big threat being a, a orangutan mother, especially if you didn't ask to be. And um, so they were, uh, um, were like, man, maybe we shouldn't do this. So um, 
We started the process of um, what are we going to do next. And SSPs, especially the orangutan SSP, has a, this really cool list of, of surrogate mothers. And luckily, we got um, a few of our females are on the list. But um, I probably should push, push my nest thing. But, but when we knew Damati was com, um, coming to Atlanta, it turns out that his name means becoming in the Malay language. We were like, yep, he is going to be coming to Atlanta, all right. <laughs> and uh, um, just, it just, it just, you know, once we found that out, it was like, yeah, this is going to work just fine. So what we had to do next is this is Madhu, and if you guys remember, she was, um, uh, had to become a surrogate to our, our awesome Bernas, who was born in 2002 here at the zoo and um, needed to be hand-reared, which we successfully did for about six months, but, you know, obviously he needed to be with an orangutan mom. So Madhu, who has never had a kid of her own, but is just an awesome female, we thought we'd give her a whirl. So the SSP was willing to give her uh, another chance. So we started doing that um, and again. And this is Damati when he was at the nurse. Few, the next few slides are of him in the nursery at um, Fort Wayne. And um, this one's kind of, I don't know. It's like... <laughs> Oh, I forgot that I had those pictures of him. It's like, I don't know if I should show them because they, they kind of look funny. But that's okay. Um, it, it's like, he was like, I, the, the dates on the CD were like, he was only just like about two or three days old here. So it's not his fault. <laughs> and, um, but uh, for the people at Fort Wayne, and, and by the way, that's a really neat little zoo if y'all have ever a chance to go up there. Um, they, they, it's a nice zoo. And, um, they did a wonderful job hand rearing him, went by the books and did everything that um, either had been done successfully in the past, or they were always calling people. The only thing they did that I didn't like was, I guess somewhere in the book it says don't put diapers on them, but um, we didn't do that with Junie and um, they did it with him. So it was like, yikes, when we got him, he would not keep a diaper on and it was not fun for the first couple of days. Um, but he wouldn't... Um, they had all the, the essentials for him. He was able to, um, he spent a little bit in the beginning in their veterinary hospital, but then was able to move into a real small, um, their behind the scenes for the orangutans is very small. And um, the, uh, but their cages were all set up. So he was able to sleep and be 24 seven right next to the two adults that um, he was supposedly gonna go in with. So he was always exposed to other orangutans and the long calls of their mail and um, and everything else. Their their exhibit is uh, totally indoors, and they um, and it's kind of cool looking. But I think you're better off with us. But um, they uh, they flood the bottom um, most of the year so that the orangutans don't go down. Of course, they do anyway and fish stuff out of the water and all this kind of stuff. And um and then they're closed during the winter. So in the winter they take all the water out and the orangutans play down in the the bottom, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, but I think for an orangutan or any animal, you know, it's kind of nice being obviously being able to get to go outside. And they did a lot of um, enrichment with him. Um, I think he kind of got a little enrichment overload, though. It was just like when when I got him, I thought, well, we got to introduce him to hay slowly and paper slowly. So, oh no, he got it all at once. It's like he's got all kinds of stuff in here, but he seems to enjoy it. He's a very very independent um, orangutan. And uh, he's just, he's, he's a quite the joy. And um, so this is, um, he was kind of surprised to learn that uh, he was going to be coming to Zoo Atlanta. And um, the, the hardest part was um, when um, Stephanie, the, um, the uh, vet tech, went with me. And it was really scary because we, we were told, you know, to wear our zoo clothes and because we were going to be, there was going to be a lot of media and stuff. Man, was that like the most awkward thing because we were walking around with our Zoo Atlanta shirts on and everybody in the zoo, you know, you're the ones that are taking our baby. And it was like, oh, it was really hard. And it was like, I'm sorry. You know, and um, it, it was just, it was very awkward, very awkward to spend the day with, we, Stephanie and I want, needed to make the transition, for, especially for Dumati to make sure that, you know, he wouldn't be scared coming with us and leaving, you know, his other mothers who he's known since birth. And it was really, it was a hard time because, um, you know, they were, I couldn't imagine if we had to, to give Bernas up, but you have to do what's right for the baby. But um, that would have been really hard. So, but anyway, this was just me getting um, interviewed up there. 
Well, we got on a plane, and um, that, that part was pretty fun. I got to sit in the cargo seat, and um, I guess F.A. rules, he couldn't come out of his little crate, and he slept the whole entire flight, and when the bump, the, the bump of the landing, he woke right up and then started crying. So, but we made it, and um, this was his first day um, in quarantine here at the zoo. It was just funny. I told him, you know, you know, pack a few of his things, and, of course, it was like, you know, packing the suitcase for the trip. He had all kinds of toys, and that was his, you know, his little stuffed monkey was what he liked the best. So, but that's um, his, him exhausted after his flight. Look at the beauty now. Um, so this is Dumadi now. Um, so he's been a wonderful uh, addition to our zoo. And what's really neat is, well, Madhu's been an okay surrogate. I mean, what she's doing is working, but, oh, it's just funny because it was really, it was like, okay, I already did this once, and now you're making me do it again. And I didn't even tell you if I liked it the first time, <laughs> but you're doing it again. And um, so she really is not the bet as great as she was with Junior, but it works. And Dumati's a very independent, healthy um, baby that um, we were lucky that he um, was independent because um, with Junior, with Bernas Junior, um, you know, he was very clingy and Madhu always held him like a mother should. Dumati did, didn't like to be held. Um, he just wanted to be off and doing things. So when we first started putting them together, and especially outside, the first day was really um, heart-wrenching because she carried him just like she should, and, you know, we taught her, get the baby, get the baby, and she would always do exactly what she was supposed to do, but he was pushing off of her, and she was nervous and didn't like that, and she would take him and just shake him like, no, not that, and it was really hard to watch, and he was screaming, and she was shaking him, you know, and, um, but she was doing that because she knew that that's what she's, that was her job, you know, and, and so she still leaves him a lot, but he wants to be, and um, when he, any time um, it's, it's time for him to need an orangutan mother, she is right there. And um, just last week, Madhu had to be immobilized for an annual exam. And so it was like, oh, boy, you know, um, what are we going to do with the Madhu? And he hung with the group, you know, wasn't that big a deal, except about 15 minutes after he realized mom was gone, he started screaming and crying, and the other orangutans were trying so hard to help him. And um, he did pretty good until he saw her come back from the procedure and she was still asleep. And he wanted her so bad, we slipped, it, slipped him in with her while she was still asleep, and it was so sweet. So it was neat to see that even though she's not the best, that Madhu is his mother, and there's no substitute for that, you know. And it was just really neat to see that, that relationship. But the cool thing about Dumadi now, too, is he's been able to build an, an unbelievable relationship with Bernas. And, um, you know, all, next to the mother-infant or mother-child bond in a primate species, the peer it, um, relationship is really so unbelievably important. And so we're kind of sad for poor Lasatu in yard one. He, does, he only has the old fogey parents to play with. But um, he, he looks longingly at the other boys playing, and I wish we could slip him over there sometimes. But um, Junior, the first couple of days we put them together, though, it was very hard to watch because Junior was a little aggressive, and there was, there was all kinds of male parts that were like, you know, like little swords that were like getting fought with and stuff. And look at mine, no, look at mine, it's better. And it was just like, it was, it was a little hard to watch at first. And it was like, oh, but they finally stopped that. And um, they're really the, they're the best of friends right now. And it's just a, a really cool relationship um, to watch. And we're just so unbelievable that we got to be, that they're two, they're growing up like this. Um, the next unbelievable part of Dumadi is his relationship with Shantek. And if you guys know Shantek, he's our adult male who, um, you know, knows some sign language, went to Col Orang College, and is, is unbelievably um, intuitive and in touch with everything. And, you know, we were just like, you know, this is the baby, Shantek. And he'd be like, yeah, baby. And, um, you know, give me a cracker. I don't care. And <laughs> the first couple of days that we introduced them, I mean, Dumadi was really nervous around Chanda because, of course, here's this big hulk of an animal just, you know, moving around, and Dumadi was real nervous. And I forget exactly how long afterwards it took, but it, it almost didn't take long for the, these two to build a really unbelievable relationship. And it's cool because you feel really bad for orangutan males in the wild. They don't do this. They breed with the females for a few weeks at a time, get her pregnant, and they're gone. They don't, they don't even 
set eyes on their kids. So it's, it's really neat. Um, I mean, it's, this isn't, uh, it happens in other zoos. Um, we learned of a orangutan at a Toledo Zoo named Boomer who actually became like a surrogate dad and they had this little picture of him holding his little baby. And um, so it's just really neat. And these two together, are, it's just really sweet. And Chantek, when you see, you know, just how, you know, enormous he is and how enormous it wouldn't take but a second for him to, think, you know, and, and snap a um, little D in half or something. And uh, it's just really neat. And with it, with Chantek's sign language, um, when, the, like the other day when we had to mobilize Madhu, he, we were like, Shantek, you know, you need to help with the baby, you know, find the baby. So he, he was carrying him and trying, and, but then when Damati got unconsolable, when he saw Madhu, Shantek kept looking at us, and he was, like, stretching Damati, like, I'm trying, and Damati was, you know, <laughs> and he'd be like, I'm trying, I'm trying, and, um, you know, he was just so sweet, and he'd be like, you know, get the baby, and, or, oh, let's see if Beth remembers, it's like he was, he was doing something funny where it'd be like, oh, Damati would kind of be next to him, and you'd, you'd kind of, it'd, be fun to, it'd be fun to watch Shantek sign baby, uh -huh. you know, ba Shantek sign baby, and he'd just like whack Damati, like he's right here. <laughs> it's like, you know, what's a, what's a sign for baby? And he'd touch Damati, it's like stupid, he's right here. You know, but it was like, um, but uh, it, it's just unbelievable, and um, uh, it's, I suppose um, that's what the main focus of, of my next, the next part of my talk is what's happening to these guys in the wild is that, um, you know, sometimes I feel like, well, I know that um, we that work with, are lucky enough to work with these guys behind the scenes um, and have them a part of our lives. It's, it's just, it's phenomenal. And I could tell you, I could stand up here for days telling you great stories about how awesome these animals are. And, I'm not saying the other animals aren't awesome. I'm not saying, you know, the gorillas aren't. I'm just telling you, I've spent a lot of time with these orangutans, and they're, they're quite the animal. And um, to, uh, to know what's happening to these guys in the wild is, is pretty sad. Um, this is, you know, the numbers look okay when you look at them up on the big screen, but they're really not the, um, and just for backup, you know, orangutans are only fi found in um, Borneo, Sumatra and Malaysia, and um, things are just horrible for them over there right now. These numbers look okay, they look big when you see them, but the, the decline that they're in the wild that um, they're seeing is so quick, there's almost no way these guys are ever gonna catch up. So, um, and when, when I always think about, you know, some of the cool things the orangutans do and the relationships that they have with each other and with us, I just know there's, there's gotta be the exact same um, animal in the wild acting the same way. You know, I bet you, um, I was telling um, Debbie and Lori earlier, our, one of our adult females, BG, she loves to weave. And, you know, some behavior, she, well, you know, never made her weave before. So that's a good thing. We might start doing that, like our, it's our painting sweatshop. Now we're going to have a weaving sweatshop. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, um, we never taught her how to do that. But she'll take anything she can, either strips of bamboo, um, and when they get sheets to play with, or there's even um, like, you know, those, the old computer paper that has the perforations, you know, that can go on for miles. We've been able to put that in the shredder, so it comes out with these huge, long um, things of paper. And she'll take those things and just weave all over the cage. And it's really cool to watch her do it. And she'll just goes back and forth and makes these really cool things and, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, I bet there's someone in the wild that weaves, you know, that has picked up this cool behavior that they obviously enjoy. And, you know, for whatever reason, but it's just really cool. And Bee Gees does this other neat thing that um, I was trying to get some video, but I, I couldn't. Next time I will get it for you. But um, she lives with our adult male, Jantan, who she just, they just adore each other. They've been with all different kind of orangutans through the years here at Zoo Atlanta. And they've just, actually, she's his great aunt but they have, they have found each other and just are real, a real special pair. They, they don't, um, well, they did breed years ago, but we stopped that quick. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, not, that's not their relationship. It's just really unbelievable. Well, BG, anytime we need um, JT to move or, you know, oh, come on, guys, it's time to come in, she'll come in. Where's JT? Oh, just a minute. And she'll go, and she'll go get him, and she very sweetly will either take his hand 
or take a part of his hair and just walk him, you know. And it's just, it's really, it's, it's unbelievable to see her do that. And, you know, I just know that there's that, that pair in the wild somewhere. And it's, it's sad to think that, um, you know, that something's happening to these guys, the same guys in the wild, that they're being abused and, and tortured and, and taken from their homes. So what, you know, what is the main um, issue for these orangutans? And these are also the things that I have up here are things that you can avoid that maybe will help um, the um, production of these things in, in the forest from, from depleting their homes. But um, one of the biggest things that um, Indonesia has become the world's largest producer is, is rayon. So don't buy any more of those baby blue leisure suits and you won't have to worry about it. Um, um, two things, it's like, crap, I, w I didn't know this, and I was kind of sad to hear of p even patchouli, and um, that's a, the, um, I love the smell of that stuff, and, and sandalwood, not to use it, because the, the um, plants that they use uh, cause forest defragmentation, and for orangutans, for, uh, with their, you know, they live in, in small groups in different parts of the forest, and some of the huge things that have, that have been um, breaking up their populations are all the major roads that the company, logging companies and whoever is in there destroying the forest are making and they're splitting up these um, populations. So you're having little groups and groups of them. So, um, and then of course your hardwoods that you see. I also learned that anytime you see something that says it's tropical hard plywood, it doesn't matter, it's never sustainable, so don't ever buy that. And this was something that was kind of interesting, um, that dowels that are made from, I guess you pronounce it ramen, which grows in the, the peat swamps of Borneo, in, Indonesia has become the world's largest dowel producer. And unless you get a dowel that has the seal from the forestry, I think it's FSC or something, is that right? Um, it's, not, it's probably made from ramen dowels and it's and everything mostly um, tool, you know, rods. And it's like, great, you know, so probably even the rakes we use to clean up after our orangutans are probably made from that stuff. And it basically what I was reading, it says just buy plastic ones and you'll probably be able to know for sure that you haven't um, bought um, anything that's harmed the rainforest. But this is a picture of um, a palm oil plantation which palm oil is the number one reason for decline of orangutans in the wild. You can see the forest in the background and um, the precision of these palm oil plantations. Um, to be able to make these plantations, um, the illegal logging has always been rampant in Indonesia. Indonesia is probably the most corrupt um, government um, in the world that's let anybody come in and log even on protected fo in protected forests. So, um, that really has, it's been a problem. Now it actually goes hand in hand with the palm oil crisis because landowners are quickly burning, clear cutting forests as they can make a quick buck off the lumber that they get off their lands and the, um, the uh, palm oil plants gr start growing faster so you know they'll get their return um, quicker. So um, these are just a couple of things that, um, I don't know, if it, it brings it home or not, but um, maybe kind of up to date. Um, now the uh, the palm oil. I'm not an expert. I just play one here at the zoo. Um, you know, I, I'm learning, just probably like you guys have been about this whole thing. It's very frustrating, very confusing. But um, but basically, palm oil is the world's cheapest oil and it the oil plant itself flourishes in heat and regular rainfall. So the, um, Indonesia has the perfect um, place to grow this stuff. And in Southeast Asia, each decade since 1980, the palm oil production has doubled in Malaysia and Indonesia. And so right now they are the, the world's largest producers of palm oil. And um, it's in you know shampoo, cookies, um, soon it'll be probably used in your car. And it doesn't just say palm oil, it can even just say vegetable oil. Well, I don't know, you know, what that, it could just be anything. And the, it's just, and it's real cheap, so obviously, you know, you can't, sometimes you can't fault some of these companies for wanting to do this. But in 2004, um, 
the round table for sustainable palm oil was formed and it basically was the purpose is to certify the production of oil from non-destructive plantations cool it sounds like somebody's really doing something but the question is will the R and the RSPO make a difference or is it simply an eyewash to help companies appear politically correct and in as, as recently as May 1st of this year the world's largest consumer goods company, Unilever, and they make um, Dove products, Slim Fast. Um, what? Okay, you looked good. And um, but really, basically everything. And um, you know, I was like, yay! You know, here's a company that basically, if you see Unilever, it's like great. You know, they they um, support support sustainable palm oil. But then about three months ago, it started coming out that they weren't. And you're like, great, you know, who do you trust? Well, it finally um, they, there was enough pressure from um, the public for Unilever to pledge that it would switch to palm oil that did not give a death warrant for orangutans, but it may take until 2015 for this all to get going. So it's like, oh, that's just great. You know, if you do the math, you know, by, so by 2015, they'll be using 100% sustainable palm oil. Like, well, you know, but I guess... People, they're try There's at least people that are trying out there, and um, uh, that. Um, but the the problem with orangutans now, and, and what they're what most of the conservation projects that that we're trying to to help, is these orangutans are obviously, you see from the um, the habitat is there is none, and since orangutans live and eat spend their whole lives in trees, when the trees get taken, damn, um, the, uh, um, the animals are either left starving or they're starting now to wander into the, um, either, either right into the plantations themselves. Um, and the, like this male orangutan was actually uh, um, beaten and taken by palm oil workers, but there's um, some groups out there that do if they have enough time, can rescue these guys um, before they're killed. But um, that's pretty much what's been happening um, to all of these orangutans. And there's one of the um, things that I, I don't know if some of you have seen, seen me talk before, or I know for sure maybe some of you have seen, you know, the orangutan diaries um, thing that's been on TV, which has been kind of goofy, but it's been neat because it's really um, brought orangutans and their plight, you know, um, into the world. And so, you know, is there any hope? Do you, you think there's anything we can do? And, and I don't know. I mean, when Debbie was telling you about our ACE group, we, we seem to struggle with it sometimes, too. Is With the uh, um, gorilla conservation, you know, you can, someone can say, what, what's going to save the mountain gorilla is a lot of patrols and rangers out there stopping the poaching, and, and we need um, X amount of radios and 10 pair of boots and, and three new trackers. It's like, yes, it's very concrete, and, you know, think that's probably going to help. With orangutans, not so much, because the, 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 the demise of the orangutan is going to be the politics and what's happening to them with the palm oil prices. Basically, the, the experts are saying now that that is what is going to, it's, it's the palm oil. That's, if you, we can do something about the palm oil plantations, that's um, the best that we're going to be able to do. And there's two um, places that, that we've been able to support, and uh, one of them is, is Nyaro Mentang. It's in Borneo, and, it, and it's the place that was uh, showcased on uh, the orangutan diaries. Um, this woman who was volunteering years ago, just taking care of some orangutan babies, um, Lona Drescher Nielsen, ended up just getting into the saving orangutan business, and it's it's definitely one of those things you're like, I don't know what if what she's doing is is really gonna solve the puzzle, but somebody has to do what she's doing, and she basically helps the babies, the injured and um, abandoned, confiscated orangutans. Um, in the project started in 2000, she was like, oh, I'm going to build a nice little place and maybe have about 100 um, orangutans. Now she has over 600 orangutans in her facility, and the, basically the only thing she can do is kind of what she was doing on Orangutan Island. She finds these small islands that I guess she buys or whatever, and 
tries to release small groups of orangutans that can live together, and she can um, help sustain their lives by, you know, extra feedings and things like that because she needs more room back at her centers that keep filling up with these orangutans that are caught up in the palm oil crisis. Unfortunately, um, uh, she sometimes gets more adults than she does babies, which is hard because babies are babies, and they're like human infants. They get a lot of love and attention at these centers, and they're probably spoiled rotten. They're going to be all right. But the, adult, the adults that have spent their whole lives in the wild get pulled and get squished in these little cages because that's all she can do. Um, it's really sad to think about that. But she um, is a wonderful woman, and she's got a really, a really good um, support of a lot of um, conservation groups. And the orangutan diaries thing on Animal Planet just shot up her support um, like crazy. So she's of course, isn't doing, I mean, with 600 orangutans and the staff that she has to have to take care of them, probably unbelievable. But, um, uh, and there's another uh, company, or company, project that we've started to support, SOCP, which is a Sumatran orangutan conservation project. Um, and they are kind of doing the same thing, but on a lot um, smaller scale. But they're, um, Ian Singleton, the guy who runs that place, is a, he's a scientist, and so he's really trying to make sure um, he's doing all the same things. He's raising these guys like they should be, you know, releasing them into protected forests when they're ready. But he's actually um, uh, doing field research and following these guys and just to make sure, you know, to see what they've done. And um, the project began in 2003, and they've had more than 90 orangutans that have been released in protected forests. And the field observations suggest a survival rate um, is as high as 80 percent. So, you know, it's neat that he's got some numbers to back him up that what he's doing um, is working. Because I guess for orangutan, they should take 80 percent of whatever because that's probably pretty good. Um, so, you know, you've heard me say the last few years, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, the numbers are horrible of, of when you think these guys uh, basically are going to be extinct in the wild. Um, the rehab centers, I guess, um, if they're able to somehow breed their orangutans, will maybe at one point replenish the population, probably never in our lifetime, but, um, but basically orang wild orangutans will be gone. Um, and the, there's this man named Hardy, who is a young Indonesian who's been doing some groundbreaking work um, that the Orangutan Conservancy, which is an organization that, that we support, um, there's so many out there, you're like, I don't know who to trust, but we trust the Orangutan Conservancy. You know, I just... Uh, hope that I can leave you with um, a reason to learn more about orangutans. Um, Zoo Atlanta website, you know, has some really good um, links to go to, and um, you can always just keep your ears and eyes open for things that ACE is doing. Um, we've been able to, um, I don't know if we've made any kind of difference, but we've been able to send some big checks to, um, to help gorilla and orangutan conservation in the wild, and it feels pretty good to be able to know that, I don't know if it helped or not, but at least we tried and did something, so um, that is all. <laughs> okay, thank you, Laura. Um, so if any of you are married, you know what BG's like with with JT dragging him by the hand and leading him away. So um, our final speaker for this evening is Dr. Joseph Mendelson, who's the curator of herpetology and an adjunct associate professor of biology at Utah State University. Joe received his doctorate at the University of Kansas and has been studying neotropical amphibians and reptiles for almost 20 years, concentrating on Mexico, Guatemala, Panama, Ecuador, and Peru. Much of his work has involved systematics and taxonomy, including the discovery and description of approximately 50 new species of amphibians. In recent years, as the crisis of global amphibian extinctions, that's hard to say, extinctions has become evident, Dr. Mendelssohn has redirected much of his energy to conservation programs aimed at understanding the root causes of amphibian declines and to conceive and implement proactive conservation programs. The results of his work have been published in journals such as Science, Molecular Ecology, and the Journal of Herpetology. This evening, Joe will tell us how, in addition to the care it provides for the herpetology collection, Zoo Atlanta's herpetology department extends considerable commitments to three focal areas of research and conservation, Asian turtles, Guatemalan beaded lizards, 
and neotropical frogs, each of which is facing very different conservation challenges. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Mendelson. Hello, folks. I have an awful lot to cover. So what you're going to get here, I'm going to go really quickly, and it's going to be very compressed, and you're going to get, uh, can we back up, please, a couple slides? And you're going to get a lot of overview and not a whole lot of depth. Well, maybe too far back up there. Oh, I, I better not meddle. I'll hold on a second. Well, I can start there. Is that a good place to start? Okay. No? Okay, I'm going to start with there. Okay, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the Department of Herpetology is staffed a little bit differently than most uh, departments in the, in the, at the zoo here. We have uh, uh, a PhD in charge, and we have a DVM, a, a veterinarian who's assistant curator, and one more than that, he's a diplomat in the, uh, in, the, in the veterinary world, which means he's a certified reptile specialist. That's the difference between being an, an MD, a medical doctor, and a neurosurgeon. So we have a highly overeducated curatorial staff in our department. <laughs> and what that means is that we are also charged with doing things beyond the normal. So yes, we take the best care possible of our animals, but we're also charged with really doing some groundbreaking research and leading some conservation programs, which I'm gonna to talk to you about. And the ones we focus on are amphibians, Asian turtles, and Guatemalan beetle lizards. So I'm gonna walk you through each of those. And those are the taxa we specialize on. And then within our field, we focus on three different things, biodiversity and taxonomy. In other words, ahead of just conserving biodiversity, and I, don't, I shouldn't understate it that way, just conserving biodiversity. Yes, we work to conserve biodiversity, but we also do the basic groundwork to discover and document new biodiversity. And in collaboration with our vet staff, we do basic research in veterinary care and husbandry. In other words, don't just do what everyone else does, figure out how to do it better. Right? And then we are act very active in both field and captive conservation programs. So, as for biodiversity and taxonomy, the simple act, I mean, you take it for granted, you walk around the zoo and there's that funny little scientific name on the bottom of every, on, the, on, on every sign, right? That name means somebody put the work into realizing that that species is different than every other species in the world and it needs to be formally assigned a name. One species, one name. Simple concept, a lot of work. And so uh, since 2004, we've described and named uh, nine new species in total. Our staff in our department, which also includes uh, Dr. Brad Locke, the assistant curator, and Dr. Dwight Lawson, who is a senior VP, but he's a herpetologist and contributes to our department. Um, Zoo Atlanta has uh, discovered and described over 50 new species of amphibians and some reptiles as well. And we have four in progress for 2009. Here's a toad we, we named from Mexico a few years ago. Here's a toad from Panama. And then this one, we nicknamed it Spiky because the little spikes on its eyeballs. And the name isn't published yet, so it has to remain a secret. So it's up to your guess what we're going to actually name that one. I know it, but I can't tell you. <laughs> Veterinary care and husbandry, moving beyond routine care, okay? What works, what doesn't work? Okay, if something's not working, let's figure out how to make that work and figure out how to make it work better or stop doing it, right? Long-term assessment of reproductive health of endangered tortoises. As you'll see in a moment, we're in the business, quite sadly, of receiving dozens and dozens and dozens of extremely abused and ill Asian tortoises that cannot be returned to the wild. Our job, make them better and learn how to breed them. And you can't look this up anywhere. These are species that no one has kept in captivity before, right? There's no place to look it up. What's it eat? I don't know, carrots or mice? I don't know. Try both. It didn't eat either. What's next? Mushrooms? Try that. What's that, right? So you're stuck in this world. It's not breeding. It's producing eggs. You can see in the radiograph here, but then she doesn't lay them. Or she produces eggs and she lays them and they don't hatch. 
What's going on? Okay? You're stuck in this round of trial and error where error isn't acceptable. Okay? So you have to fix that. Um, a little more close to Georgia here, indigo snakes, right? Artificial insemination of an, an endangered indigo snake, right? That had never been done on a snake before. Did it work? No. But we figured out why it didn't work. That's the most important part. We try new things as long as it doesn't harm the animals, and we learn from it, and we move forward. Next time, we'll get it right. And then our field and captive, con and captive conservation programs. That's what I spend the rest of the talk on here, right? We focus on Asian turtles, Guatemalan beaded lizard, and global amphibians. I didn't punch a button there at all. <laughs> so for Asian turtles, this incredible. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, folks. We had a little uh, difficulty here. Well, if you can read through the thing, as for Asian turtles, this incredible organization called the Turtle Survival Alliance was conceived and co-founded by Dr. Dwight Lawson and also our collaborators at Fort Worth Zoo. Really importantly, on all these next slides, you're going to see over in this lower left-hand corner, collaborators. We do a lot here, but none of this can be done alone, right? And what this is is a global partnership of zoos and aquariums and, and private individuals. So we broke out of the AZA framework because we had to in terms of capacity to house and breed turtles from the food trade and confiscations, and quite importantly, to develop capacity to continue to do that in range countries, okay? Why did this have to happen? Because here is just one example, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these. December 11, 2001, about 10,000 wild-caught turtles weighing 10 tons uh, packed in shipping containers were confiscated in Hong Kong for violation of shipping regulations. Note, this was not illegal, they just shipped them illegally, right? And so here what you have, they were packed in these boxes like this, here they are spreading out, starting to figure out what was in there, right? And here's where they're headed to the food markets in China, okay? Where hundreds of tons of wild-caught turtles and tortoises are sold by the pound to the food trade every single day. That is unsustainable harvest of the, of the largest sort. So now we have these turtles that they can't go back to the wild because no one knows from where they came, right? They have to go somewhere. And this is the brilliance of the Turtle Survival Alliance to find places for these things, right? Again, sorting through the carnage, many of them were already dead, triaging them, and then the emergency vet care. That turtle there, you see that mass in the middle? That's an x-ray of it. That's its uh, stomach packed full of rocks. Why? Because they're sold by the pound. Okay? So our veterinary staff did the emergency surgery, which for a turtle means black and decker, right? get inside, pull the rocks out. These rocks right here, those are the rocks that were in that turtle. The turtle's now doing fine. That's one turtle. I just said there were 10,000 in that shipment alone, right? And this has been going every single year. And no way Zoo Atlanta can absorb those kinds of tortoises and turtle, those numbers, right? There's a net, network all over the world to absorb these things, right? And they get placed in the network of facilities, which includes the private sectors, rich people's backyards who spend a lot of money and donate a lot of money to take good care of tortoises. Everybody's happy. Consequently, some of the rarest and most endangered turtles in the world are being bred by these TSA partners, okay? But making baby turtles isn't solving the root problem here, right? The root problem is figuring out how to produce enough turtles to sustain this trade, which is still not illegal. So consequently, huge programs in Southeast Asia for captive breeding, reintroductions, and, uh, and then most importantly, awareness campaigns, okay? And taking the same technology, because the problem is not only in Southeast Asia, new programs based on this model, which is clearly working in China, in Mexico, and we were called by Georgia uh, Department of Natural Resources the other day going, hey, we've got a problem with bog turtles in northern Georgia. Will you guys do what you've been doing for Asian turtles right here in Georgia? So we're starting that program this month, actually. 
Project Heloderma. Heloderma is the scientific name of beaded lizards, right? <coughs> this is the conservation of the Guatemalan beaded lizard. A little bit of difference here. What you just saw there was an, a, a group of animals, Asian turtles, that are being threatened by massive over-harvesting of at unsustainable numbers, right, for human consumption. The challenge is a little bit different here. Our partners being Organización Zootropic, a Guatemalan uh, a non-governmental organization, and the International Rep Reptile Conservation Fund. <coughs> Excuse me. And there is a spectacular Guatemalan beetle lizard right there. This species, which is three feet long, screaming black and yellow, and venomous, and very spectacular, was only discovered in 1985. They live in this isolated valley in the country of Guatemala called the Motagua. And their entire range, historically, I did the math today, was half the size of Fulton County. That's the only place in the world they lived, is an area of the world half the size of Fulton County. Okay? Now, what happens there, this is a case of massive habitat loss. Okay? At this point, there's only three parcels of land in the world that remain suitable for these things. And that's the, the things in yellow right there. The areas in red are suitable habitat, but they're not physically large enough to really house even one lizard, much less any number of them. So there's three parcels of land left in the world. And if you do the math of the little bit we know about them, we suspect there's probably room in the world left for 200 of these lizards, right? In other words, here's the whole valley down here. A hundred years ago, that was all yellow, and there were probably hundreds of thousands of lizards. At this point, there's probably only room for about 200, and in that area, we know for a fact of 17 in the wild. Certainly there's more, but we doubt that there's 200. So one of the things that Project Heloderma did, and this project is headed up by Dr. Brad Locke, the assistant curator. He gets full credit for this in association with his partners, of course. One of the first things they did is buy one of those parcels. <clears throat> the landowner did not want to sell it, but a long lobbying campaign convinced him to sell it. They bought it. It's now safe for perpetuity, managed by Zootropic, the Guatemalan non-governmental organization, which is appropriate, right? Zoo Atlanta should not be managing property. That's very imperialistic. This needs to be managed by Guatemalans for a Guatemalan project, right? Um, they're making arrangements now, looking at trying to buy this parcel. That one, I don't know the details, but it's a little more problematic. But in other words, action has to happen on the ground, secure one of the three spots left in the world for this thing while we address the other problems which they're also doing, right? Aside from habitat loss, this is a three-foot-long, scary, venomous lizard. And in rural Guatemala, when one's found, it gets chopped in half. That's what always happens. And don't think that's so bad, because isn't that what happens to almost every black rat snake in Cottonmouth in Georgia? Yes, it is. So this culture is not particularly different than our own. But by earning the trust of the villagers out in this area, Zootropic did the interviews, and they realized that between 2000 and 2001, they were aware that of 11 that were killed, okay? From 1994 to 2000, they know for a fact of 30, <coughs> excuse me, that were sold to the black market. Since the education program began in 2004, zero killed, zero sold. That is progress, people, right? And additionally, eight animals, new animals of the 17 we were known, were found by villagers and reported they weren't killed and they weren't captured and sold. They reported to the field researchers and that's eight of the 17 we now know in the wild. They now have radio tags in them, and we can track them and learn about them. So um, this project is working, and it's working incredibly quickly. I mean, I, I cannot be more impressed by how quickly this project has turned around uh, 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 the future of a species against some pretty enormous challenges. Okay, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> the last slide on there also said that um, they also received funding right now to build the first captive breeding facility in Guatemala. In association with that will be an a visitor center educational program as well. So the last program I'm going to mention to you here is the one that, uh, that I lead up more or less. And uh, there it is, the funding for the center right there. <laughs> and this project is working. This is uh, the, the main biologist in Guatemala, Daniel Arellano, who, who's been... Uh, instrumental in this doing yet another uh, public education campaign. Um, supposed to be a picture of a salamander right there. But in any case, global amphibian extinctions. <laughs> I don't lie to you folks, I told you. 
This is, um, this is without a doubt the largest biodiversity conservation challenge in human history, right? That's really easy to say. Let that sink in for a second. What I'm talking about here is that we, the amphibian biologists of the world, have recently come to the conclusion that there's probably 2,000 species of the 6,000 known species of amphibians facing imminent extinction. Think for a second. I didn't say 2,000 individuals left in the wild. I said 2,000 species veering towards extinction all at exactly the same time, right? This is why it's the biggest challenge in human history, because we've never seen anything like this before. You want to see a precedent like this, you got to go to the fossil record. That's what happened in these types of situations. And we're watching it happen on our own block right now. The, the causes of this are multitude and complicated, and I can simplify it by saying it's enormously complex, and everything that can go wrong in conservation is happening all at the same time to amphibians right now. Okay? So, it's a global problem. It requires a global response. Okay? So in 2005, the IUCN, that's the World Conservation Union. This is the World Trade Organization. This is the uh, United Nations of Conservation. This is the overarching uh, community of government and non-government organizations that are making sure that things go better, okay? They called this uh, summit in, in Washington, D.C. to come up with the, the Global Amphibian Conservation Action Plan. Here again, Zoo Atlanta, in this case, our partner is right up the street, the Atlanta Botanical Garden. Uh, we were asked to join this summit of about 100 amphibian specialists in the world to write the plan for the world, which is um, it's an honor and it's terrifying at exactly the same time to be on a panel like that. That's all I can say. And then out of that, two action arms of many that are needed, but two are up and running right now, the IUCN Amphibian Specialist Group and the Amphibian Arc, which is, a, Amphibian Arc is a little bit like Turtle Survival Alliance. This is the global network of captive uh, colonies that have to maintain all this. And the point of this is, is that both of these global uh, action-oriented arms of the IUCN were conceived and, uh, and launched here in Atlanta by Zoo Atlanta and Atlanta Botanical Garden. So what collectively has been Atlanta's response to this, both uh, the zoo and the Botanical Garden, we created the protocol and began the first attempts at doing these emergency rescues when invading diseases or wiping out amphibians and need to be uh, literally pulled into captivity when we don't want them, but they have to come in, right? That's a little bit different than confiscations, right? We do captive breed critically endangered species. We do the basic research on the husbandry and the, on the veterinary care to figure out how to do this better when you can't look it up anywhere. We do a lot of the basic research on the causes and patterns of this extinction. In other words, you can't fix the problem until you know what is the problem. And we're still trying to figure out what is the problem. Basic research, surveys and monitoring, where is the problem happening? Quite critically, where is it not happening and why, right? Capacity building and partnerships, uh, in this, we focus on Latin America. It's a global problem, but we can't do everything. And we focus with our partners in Panama, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, et cetera. And, um, and then we are involved with the program development and the leadership at the IUCN level of, of implementing global response programs. And public awareness is critical. And we work at every level from hopefully every zoo and garden visitor that comes through all the way to the level to being featured in New York Times, National Geographic, National Public Radio, et cetera, getting the word out about how real and how bad is this crisis. So in closing, what I'm trying to say here is that I'm ex extremely, extremely proud of the department that I'm uh, blessed to uh, head up in uh, Zoo Atlanta's Herpetology Department because uh, these organizations are testament to the fact that we are world leaders in conserving biodiversity. Instead of talking about it, we are doing something about it. Right? We participate in all sorts of global conservation programs in our department. But in our areas of specialty, turtles, amphibians, and beaded lizards, we also conceive and launch and head up the, the global responses to those same problems. So again, we, we are doing something about it. And this is exactly why I left my former career and came to Zoo Atlanta, because I saw the support network right, to, to be able to do really proactive conservation programs like this. Thanks. Thank you.